Welcome, everybody, to Thursday Night Live with Aish. I am Adam Jacobs, and I am delighted to be here this evening with somebody who I've wanted to speak to for four years, to be exact. We uh, opened up an email dialogue. His name is Professor Dr. Jeremy England. And um, he has a very impressive background. And uh, like I always struggle with bios because I can give over so much of the information, but let me just give you a brief sketch and welcome him to the program. Professor England earned a bachelor's in biochem from Harvard. And after receiving a Rhodes Scholarship, he studied at Oxford, then got his PhD in physics at Stanford and joined the MIT physics department as an assistant professor. In 2019, he joined GlaxoSmithKline as a senior director in artificial intelligence and machine learning. And that's just part of it. But welcome to the show, doctor. How are you this evening? Doing very well, very well thanks. Welcome. Good. So um, as I was, you know, we, were, we got a chance to schmooze a couple minutes just before the show started. And, um, and I was telling you of my personal interest in science and in theology. And I know that you share that. Um, and you have written an amazing book, which is the subject for this evening, Every Life is on Fire, which I highly recommend everybody go out and read and get. And I'd like to compliment you, first of all, for doing uh, an admirable job of bringing extremely advanced concepts down to a very readable and relatable level. Um, and that is not so easy to do with advanced physics. So um, thank you for making it readable and accessible. Thank you very much. I'm so glad to hear that was your impression of it. It was. And um, and as I mentioned to you, I I came up with about 25 questions to ask you off the top of, uh, top of my head and based on reading the book. Um, and uh, let's just jump into it. But uh, amongst other things, I'm just curious, was there a moment in your life, most people, like when I was in high school, like nobody wanted to take physics. And if you did take it, you most people didn't like it. Was there a moment in your life when you said to yourself, you know, my gosh, I, I want to be a physicist? Um, I think from a relatively early age, I thought I was interested in science. Uh, when I was very young, you know, like four or five or whatever, I, I would always say I like dinosaurs and I wanted to be a paleontologist. So very, fairly common first love of science. Um, and then I think at some point when I was a bit older, I probably first started thinking to myself, but still at the time, not very seriously, um, but in the manner that a child might, that I wanted to be a physicist when my, I think my father had a copy of A Brief History of Time by Stephen Hawking, and that had been lying around, and I sort of tried to pore over it and obviously couldn't make much sense of it, but afterwards was somehow captivated by that way of talking about the world where you could kind of, with a few deep and simple ideas, try to explain things as grand as the universe. And so I, I got my first taste of that kind of um, thinking at a fairly early age. And, and from that point on, I think I was telling people, oh, I want to be an astrophysicist. I, astrophysics turned out to be my worst subject within physics. So I never <laughs> became an astrophysicist. Um, but I, I did continue being interested in physics. And when I, when I was growing up a bit older, I was reading people like Roger Penrose um, and, and really enjoying the writing he did for uh, broader uh, consumption about complex concepts in physics. Um, and I think that was kind of the catnip for me when I was maybe in middle school. And then by the time I was in high school, I was really trying to learn as much as I could, as fast as I could about physics and got pretty deeply into it pretty early on. Cool. Um, I can't say the same thing, but I will tell you that I have developed a, a layman's interest in it um, and consider it to be really one of the most fascinating branches of science. Um, and it, it has taught us so much. And I think it has so much to teach us on a metaphysical level, even though <clears throat> metaphysics is obviously distinct from physics. Um, we'll get into whether there's any connection between those two concepts a little bit later. But, you know, you wrote this book. If you, I, you know, we could get into your thesis in it and maybe you'll say a word or two about it. Um, but what do you want people to know from your book? If you could you know, tell our audience or the world, what, is, what do you want people to walk away with and, and how do you wanna change their thinking as a result of what you've written? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Probably the answer is going to depend on 
different kinds of people that might read it. And I hope it will be different things for, for different readers. On the one hand, I think that uh, one of the purposes uh, the book is uh, in fact turning out to serve, I, I have found, is that you could think of it as sort of like a, a long form letter to scientific colleagues. Um, and what I mean by that is that when you write a scientific research paper, uh, there's so much need to be very uh, dense and technical uh, and careful with each successive point. And also uh, there's a certain kind of rhythm to the process of submission and peer review that you tend to make chunks of discovery in, in certain bite-sized pieces and do them one paper at a time. Uh, and it's not as common today as it maybe was and earlier uh, in, in the, the development of modern science, the people get to write these kind of long form contemplations um, where you get to string a whole bunch of ideas together. I mean, that still happens, you know, people write monographs, but I, I, I think that um, partly for me, this was just kind of a chance to try to make an argument from start to finish in conceptual terms that are trying to be broadly accessible, uh, but which I think still are also valuable for very technical people to read uh, just because you can cover the ground more rapidly than if you're trying to go. I mean, I also, it's, it's all based on scientific research papers that one can and should read as well if one wants to get into that. Um, but I think it's kind of a, it's it has enough content in it at that level that it has you know, value in those terms. But then obviously also it's, it's written and really most principally written for people who are not uh, professional scientists. And I think there, there are different kinds of people who might come into it with different default uh, ways of thinking about origins of life or mm -hmm. about also questions of how scientific reasoning and biblical religion mix together or don't. Um, and so the, the sort of top two reasons I think it might be um, that I, you could say I wrote the book or, or things I want different kinds of people to come away with is, you know, I hope people will on the one hand get a chance to see how physical reasoning based on theoretical ideas in physics that are very broadly accepted and, and that are very well experimentally tested, that you can construct an argument that does really start to help you change the way you think about the question of how life could emerge from inanimate material and maybe not go 100% all the way to seeing how it all clicks, but it, where you start to see a new way forward um, and, and, and where that research that's very active and, and ongoing um, is headed. But then also at the same time, to be aware that that discussion is really situated within a broader context, that you can't talk about what life is as a material phenomenon without striking chords that have to do with other aspects of how we react to the human condition. Uh, because we are living beings, you know, a family nadama, you know, made from the dust of the earth, so to speak. Uh, and we face questions about our purpose and our origin whenever we take up that subject. So I think I, I felt quite conscious of not wanting to write a book that said, oh, I, this is just about the science. Don't, don't hold the rest, you know, don't, don't hold me to anything else, you know, and take this whatever direction you want, you know, don't, don't ask me my opinion about the other things. I think I wanted to do it in a way where it was completely uh, intellectually honest about the physics and at the same time also completely intellectually intellectually honest about other things I bring to the table if we're going to have the discussion in broader terms. I like the way you put that, uh, and, I, and I think that's accurate. Um, so my understanding, tell me if you agree, is that the three questions that science has really struggled with, that people concern them, themselves with most in, in terms of the origin of things, I would count the origin of matter, the origin of life, also known as abiogenesis, um, and the the origin of consciousness, right? Like how, how did he, even if once you have a living thing, how, how does it become aware of itself? Is it fair to say that you feel like you have an understanding or the beginning of an understanding of that second question? Do you feel that you have taken a step towards the revelation of understanding how life literally emerged from non-animate matter? I think the way that I would put it is that when we pose the question about where life came from, it often sounds at the outset, and I think I try to write about this in the book, it sounds at the outset like we think we know in clear terms what it means to ask that question, but that if you start really picking away at it, uh, 
there's a lot of different things that you could have meant. Like, do you mean, you know, what are the exact specific details as though we were watching a movie of the molecules that right. really describe some best account we can make of where the life that we currently behold in the world that we live in, you know, where it came from, just tracing the thread, trying to run the movie and rewind all the way backwards. Um, and is that the interesting question? Uh, and, and would that remain an interesting question if it had begun with a few events that were seemingly highly improbable, but they happened and now we just have a bunch of um, uh, seemingly improbable consequences of that, but there's no sort of point to that? Or is it more like about the principles for how you get the essence of life, the, the distinctive behaviors of life to emerge from kind of simple rules for how bits of matter interact that don't seem to contain in an obvious way that kind of a phenomenon, the phenomenon of life as a consequence. Um, and I, I think in that case, it almost kind of carries us away from the details. Like, you know, we may not really care at the end of the day whether the life likeness that we're trying to understand has DNA or not. DNA may be a contingent fact of life as we know it, but if you started over from the beginning and you had different building blocks, could you make something that was impressively like life in many of the ways that you would list if you started to think about what is impressive about life, but it wouldn't have any DNA because it wouldn't even be able to make it because it wouldn't be made of the same kind of stuff. You could maybe do it with different kinds of atoms. Um, and so, you know, and you can start listing different ways of asking the question. Uh, and I think with that, with, with enough freedom to kind of ask about what the appropriate definition of the question is, then I do think, part of the purpose of the book is to try to say, look, there, there's there's progress that can be made in understanding how physics starts situating us with a more rigorous way of thinking about how to move things forward um, in, in, in current research. And I think from, from my perspective, and others will take a different one, what it comes down to is taking life as a physicist would look at it and saying, let me think about all the different separate physical phenomena that life consists of things like making a copy of yourself, harvesting energy from your environment, from a source that's kind of challenging to access, predicting things in your environment that are predictable, but also hard to predict, you know, various things that you could start to list like that, um, that if you study those behaviors as physical phenomena, you do start to be able to say, here are the physical principles that allow me to say when this should emerge on its own from a setting in which it's initially absent. And you can do proofs of, proofs of principle in simulation uh, and in experiment uh, that start to demonstrate this. And that's not, you know, uh, a, a slam dunk right away and you have to do it incrementally. You know, we, we just had our first collab experimental collaboration around the theoretical ideas that came out in Science Magazine um, at the, the first, of 20, first day of 2021 um, in their, you know, January 1st issue. Um, and it was just, you know, a, a swarm of simple robots banging into each other. And so, you know, it's not the origin of life on the tabletop, but I do think that my, the approach that I would try to argue for is very much one of, if I understand the principles, can I do proofs of those principles in an experimental context and show that I can gain mastery over different aspects of life likeness as they emerge in simple settings that I can devise? Great. Um, one more science, a couple more science questions. Let's see, you know, let, let's see how it goes. Um, so in your book, you give the example, which is fascinating, and I never would have considered it. But the the idea that fire is self replicating, that it, you know that it's, a, it's an example of something that that makes more of itself, you know, and you do take pains in the book to to note that you know these are simple examples that you're using them to illustrate a point, and I do appreciate that. Um, and you're also careful to note that it, it's it's several steps between there and an understanding of whatever else might have happened to produce life. And I appreciate all of that. <clears throat> I think for the, the layman like myself, it seems like the steps are so big that it's hard to appreciate, you know, the, and I've read a little bit about this, like, and I don't want to get too, too technical in the science, especially in front of you, you know, what, what like, what do I know in comparison? But, you know, I did study about uh, the Miller, Ure experiments, you know, where they put a bunch of chemicals into a, a vial of some sort and a, a created some sort of um, atmosphere and they put electrodes into it and, and they created amino acids as far as I know with that experiment. And they, they cited that as a possible 
bit of evidence that you see this is how it could have happened in the early Earth. However, it, it occurs to me in thinking about it that you had a human consciousness, you know, was put into designing that experiment. Mm -hmm. That, you know, that thought went into it. The chemicals were chosen. You know, it, does that really resemble what the early atmosphere would have been like? And do, do people really know? So I guess my question to you is, are, are you possibly jumping the gun? Mm -hmm. Like, is it is it does it look too good to be true? Like, I, there's so many steps between here and there. And one other thing just to throw out is, you know, I did read once about the, uh, the concept of the development of the eye, which seems like unfathomable to me, how such a thing could have come about through natural means. Mm -hmm. um, but starting with what's called a light sensitive patch on, mm -hmm. a, on a piece of skin. Mm -hmm. However, that would have had mutations would have caused this light sensitive patch. And then this whole series of steps, I think 26 different steps of mutations that had to happen until the eye existed. Um, coupled with that, the idea of uh, irreducible complexity, which I don't know if you can, you can talk about for a second, but it seems like the eye needs a whole bunch of different um, features to function once from the beginning. Mm -hmm. so my, I've said a few things, but my overall question is, because you have proven or, or shown a path forward, is it likely that we're ever going to see how that path actually unfolded? Or do you, are you confident about that? Um, or are you just trying to say, look, this is how it could have gotten going, and I'm showing you how that is, and, and we may not ever really know, you know, um, what happened after that. I, I think that's a very appropriate question to ask. Um, I, there are a few parts there. So the first thing I would just say is that if you are uh, making distinction between, let's say, charting what looks to be a fruitful direction versus having arrived all the way there. I think there's no question that uh, no one should claim right now that we can fill in all the details of how everything that we find impressive about all the examples of what we call truly life today come together because uh, that's a whole lot. You know, if you, if you think about the simplest bacteria that we know of as maybe the most sort of bona fide clear examples of this is alive, even though it's relatively simple, uh, they're incredibly complex. And, and there are many different parts that have to work together to make this thing able to do what it does. Um, and, and you can almost think of them as like a functioning economy of a whole city that already is arranged in all these ways that have this interdependency and, and coordination. Um, and it's always difficult, I think, to uh, dissect a complex living whole like that, where there are those interdependencies, and and start to think about, you know, how how exactly would the origin uh, of that work? Much the same way, you know, if you're sort of speak a Martian or just someone who had never studied anything about history, and you were just studying a city, right, and you you were trying to just from its present day properties. Uh, back solve to how it had formed. Like, what was it like when only a thousand people lived there or when only a hundred people lived there, right? It's not the same kind of process, but what that points to, I think, is that uh, it is a, uh, an evolutionary process that is at a higher level than, you know, that, that of individual living things in, in the case of a city, but where there are things about how the whole kind of becomes interdependent and organizes, where at the end, it's really hard to say, well, how do I take this apart? I mean, there's like, there's the sewer system and there's the electrical power grid and all these things are working together and it seems like you can't have one without the other. Uh, but I think sometimes that's because there's there's so much that happens in the early stage that just seems completely invisible by the time you have the final state uh, that that aspect is challenging. So I don't want to diminish the difficulty of building that bridge completely. If we're talking about, we want to do like a really a blow by blow, blow chronology. Like when did cellularization happen? Where you had things that were enclosed by membranes and now they were, you know, forming uh, copies of themselves by splitting in half. And and when did modularity, meaning that you you could take different pieces of these things and say this is a you know organelle or an organ that has a specific function that's specialized and you can break it apart and you know plop it in somewhere else and it will accomplish the same function. When did these things start to happen? You know, there, there's a there's many questions like that that I should not pretend anything I've done uh, or, or or any anyone else has done in the same kind of vein of research that I'm trying to point to and describe in my book um, uh, 
uh, that I shouldn't pretend that I've, I've really scratched the surface up. I think that what I, I would like to claim uh, it is possible to do with the, 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 approach, the approach that I tend to incline towards as a theoretical physicist thinking about this uh, is to kind of reset our notion of how much we should rush to declare something so unlikely that it could never have happened uh, without some crazy fluke. Because I think sometimes the models that we make for that, where we try to compute unlikelihood and claim something was impossible or extremely unlikely, are, if not deliberately naive, they're sort of, um, they take the, the, the fact that we haven't progressed even a little bit theoretically and sort of use that as an excuse to use very primitive ways of computing likelihood. And if you just kind of try to think about it a little bit more, you can change the likelihood of, of certain things dramatically. Like, so for example, um, maybe this, this helps make the, the main point. So very often we think of one of the things that living things do as, as being the, that they sense patterns in their environment and they act in ways that instantiate accurate predictions of the likely future of their environment, right? And if we want to explain that as an outgrowth of evolutionary selection, we could, we could say in a living thing, that's because, you know, you don't want to get eaten or you want to catch the food that you're trying to catch. And there are all these reasons that having the ability to sense your environment and predict it will help you to get access to the food that you need in order to copy yourself. And so you can make this Darwinian argument for why that kind of thing exists. And I think people often just kind of don't lose sleep, or sleep over it because they feel it's explained by a Darwinian mechanism. But I think that it's important to ask, can I get that same kind of behavior from matter even without a Darwinian mechanism, even without a living thing that makes copies of itself? So if I just have more naive kind of dumb, simple building blocks, what you might call basic chemicals or basic kind of colloidal particles that stick together in a certain way or whatever kind of basic working material you want to have, right? Your afarmina adama, your dust of the earth, right? It can be put together in different ways that are going to have different properties. I can assemble the same kinds of atoms together and make a blue whale or a pile of hamburgers or, you know, a, a bunch of tables or whatever else. So if, if I have many different ways I could put these building blocks together, can I understand the physics of why a pile of building blocks could get into a state that looks like it's accurately predicting something that's hard to predict about the patterns in its environment and sort of acting like a computer, but it wasn't actually because there was a self-copying thing that was already alive or even just self-copying that was operating by a winning mechanism. Um, and, and I think the more you can demonstrate those kinds of examples where a distinctive lifelike behavior is you know, you can understand its emergence in a context that's very naive and inanimate and primitive. Um, and you can do that uh, in, in a way that suddenly changes your idea of what the primordial soup can do, like how smart it is before life gets going. That really has to adjust any games that you end up playing about saying, well, how likely is it that all of this stuff would come together? Because I think some of what we see as very specialized and functional and exceptional in the architecture of life it might be that that toolbox is in its rough cut, kind of lying around, so to speak, even before life gets going. I hear that. You know, that's complex. That's a it's a deep thing to consider, obviously. Uh, but you've done it, and um, and like like I said, pointed the way, perhaps. Um, and obviously, there's a lot more work to be done. And you're, uh, I, I'm looking forward to following your career. You're a young guy, and you've done a lot already. And I'm sure there's a lot to come. But let's let's take a little bit of a transitional step, you know, between physics and metaphysics, and and I'll, I'll do it by asking the following thing. Um, as I mentioned, I really enjoyed the book. I finished it today, and I got a lot out of it on on multiple levels. And but um, on page ninety eight, you say the goal of the heart, and that's that's all I wrote down. And then I asked myself as I was reading that, what, what do you mean? Does the heart have a goal? According to your theory, would you say that that, that seems like there was a, a specific purpose to a heart? Would you say, therefore, that the, is the heart a, a designed pump, you know, or is it is it the product of its environment and the, the molecules got knocked around however they did? over a long enough period of time and, and they ended up looking like that because it works. 
Yeah, well, so um, I, I think that this discussion within the scientific context, context um, the way that it comes out is that even just shifting between biology and physics, you have a greater or lesser sense of there being a natural way of talking about teleology you know, with, with the science that you're doing. So what I mean is things in physics don't have a purpose. You can use physics to make things, you know, you to engineer things that have a purpose that you've decided. But from a very sort of conservative physicist's view of the world, matter is just, it has properties, but no purposes. It's just like flying around and banging in other bits of matter. And it keeps doing that according to simple rules. That's what the world looks like when the physicist looks at it. And I'm not saying that's all I see when I look at the world because I'm not only a physicist. And I think one of the things people often don't want to admit about science is that it's kind of like taking a black and white photograph of a subject of interest and sometimes of a rainbow where it's like, it's clear you're losing something very interesting about what you're uh, representing by, by your chosen right. mode of representation. So physics takes the world and talks about it in terms that make certain aspects of it extremely and precisely apparent and totally eliminates other ones from view. So purpose is one of the things that a physicist I think is a priori uh, uninterested in or, or sort of even willfully blind to when talking about pieces of matter bumping into each other. Biology is not like that because biology assumes the living thing is a phenomenon. We assume we already know what life is. We have a, a list of things that are alive, a list of things that are not, and we can argue about corner cases, but for the most part, we know fish belong here and rocks belong there. And now we can take living things and say, well, what are what are the goals of living things? Uh, and 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 maybe you can sort of you know go in different directions. And uh, maybe the influence of Darwinian thinking already has kind of changed the way we talk about that to some degree. Uh, but I still think that you could say whether you're talking about the desires of an animal or whether you're talking about selection pressures trying to you know coming from a Darwinian mechanism. Um, Trying to stay alive is probably something that you could say living things are, are kind of built to aim to do. Um, Although I would ask, why, of, why why do they have that drive? Why why not not have it? Well, well, so so that's the thing. What, what I mean is that I think that um, the word life was was a word that had clear meaning. I think to people using it long before modern science really got going, and so it's not. It's not a, a, a property of the world that's sort of picked out um, by a definition that's discovered from some kind of more abstruse scientific investigation. I think the very notion of the word life, as we have learned to use it, as, we, as we've decided it's valuable to have a word for phenomena like these, contains within it, and maybe you could argue about this, contains within it the idea of a, a desire to thrive and survive and reproduce and all the things that living things have in common in that way. And so then I think the point is you could say, all right, I have an animal. If I remove its heart, I can observe that blood stops flowing through the animal. And I also can observe that it doesn't live anymore. It's like the, the Talmudic discussion of cutting off a chicken's head. It's, it's psikresha. You cut off the head, the animal dies. And there's a very simple empirical relationship there. So you could do science on that, so to speak. And, and that can even have consequences in Jewish law. Because um, right. uh, you can't claim I didn't intend the chicken to die. I just wanted its head. Uh, right. But but I, so I similarly here, you can start to unpack the idea of what the purpose of a heart or another organ is by saying what ceases to happen if I remove this from the hole, um, and and what is it not just not just that but also what does it look to be better at doing than a random rearrangement of its constituent parts? Right. So a heart we know is good at pumping blood. If we took a heart and rearranged its atoms or rearranged even its cells we get something very scrambled and not particularly well suited to that task. Right. And so I think part of what I tried to talk about in the book is how looking from the perspective of physics, physics will never tell you, look, now the matter has purpose. But what it can talk about uh, is something that I think may be a necessary condition for our recognition of purpose, which is the idea of exceptionality in architecture. The idea that this matter is now in an arrangement that is much uh, where we're, it's extremely rare compared with most of its random possible rearrangements in, in that it has a particular property of interest. It can do something that most of its random rearrangements can't do. That doesn't mean it has a purpose. That doesn't mean it, it belongs as part of a living thing. But I think that if we can understand how matter gets that way in a more general set of contexts, we maybe start to understand why there are things that 
be can, that might eventually be co-opted as the beginnings of a heart that are already sort of so to speak lying around in the phenomena of uh, not yet living or not yet optimized for life behaviors of matter. Okay, let me take one step back. <clears throat> you mentioned the word teleology, and if anyone in the audience doesn't know what that means, it means like design, you know, purpose, design. Does the does the universe? Does physics, does biology demonstrate design and purpose or doesn't? And this goes way, way back in philosophy. And, you know, this is a, it's an old question, but I, I've been dying to ask you just, you know, as, as an actual physicist, you know, when I consider something like radioactive isotopes that have a half-life and understanding that, that it's random, that any isotope could break down would become unstable and split off. And I don't understand the process by which, how that happens. Why is it, to me, that, that seems like it's purposeful because we know the half-life of the isotope. It's always that way. And how is it that the, the particles are agreeing which ones are going to pop off and, and, and when, that it keeps this constant rate? Why don't they all just do it together at one time? Or why don't none of them do it? And to me, like the question I would ask you is like, is, doesn't there seem to be teleology in inanimate matter, matter in some level? Or, you know, for instance, the, um, the wave particle duality uh, experiment, where it almost seems as though the, the, the particles are aware of observation. Um, is this just some, you know, religious fantasy that I have? Um, or would you say that there's something to talk about there? Um, well, I, I certainly think there's something to talk about. I think it's... Um uh the beginnings of, of uh a, a, an interesting discussion um so what are the things that can be said around that so first of all um i think sometimes when we talk about once we start zooming out you know so you mentioned before these kind of three questions like origins of life origins of the universe and origins of consciousness uh and i think that's a very nice kind of frame for the things people struggle with um and and I think in some ways talking about origins of life is, is the most, uh, is the easiest to separate from philosophical traps because it already assumes the universe exists and has kind of rules by which it seems to operate. And so you don't have to start thinking about this question of, well, where do rules come from? And right, that was what, what it's like question. to make another <laughs> universe, like how, what, what kind of role of the die or or a spin of the roulette wheel is the creation of a universe in someone's imagining. And we can talk about that in a second. Um, uh, and, and I think also with consciousness, there are treacherous philosophical pitfalls because I think when people claim to be interested in consciousness, we have to make distinction between what it's possible to talk about with science and what people maybe are really reaching for when they say they're fascinated by that topic because science is by definition concerned with what can be made objective right. and subjective experience is by definition the opposite of that. Right. Uh, and so I think doing science on behaviors of things that seem conscious is possible, but doing science on why I feel to myself like I am a thing riding behind a pair of eyes and I'm not just a kind of soulless assemblage of matter behaving in the same way I think that there are actually uh, philosophical kind of snakes eating their own tail hidden in there that mean that we can't actually call that a scientific question. It's a different kind of discussion. It really rolls all the way back to why do I think anything but my own experience is real? And you know, if you're asking that question, that's not for a scientist. That's no, you're that's, in philosophy. You have to have assumptions you're making as a precondition for scientific reasoning that are are not made yet when you're asking that question. And I think that question is part of what the Torah is interested in engaging with. And even, you know, at this moment, that is the, the, the source of the title for my book, you know, when Moshe Rabbeinu is at the, the burning bush at, at the Sine in Har Chorev, um, when he encounters HaKadosh Baruch Hu, uh, when he encounters uh, the creator of the world for the first time, I think that one of the questions in the background, there is a kind of this epistemic one of how do you bring a whole nation into sharing in the experience of encounter that you yourself are having alone in a desert, standing over a burning plant, right? Where, which I mean, I'm not 
I, I'd be suggesting, oh, it, it was all just a sort of drug-induced hallucination. But I don't think it's an accident that that's there in the text for us to wonder about because it's pointing to this question of what's the difference between a personal encounter with the world's creator and one that can be shared by a nation. And in this case, the nation that Moshe brings back to that same mountain. That's not a, an easy discussion. That's We could have a whole uh, hour-long discussion about that. I mean, it's, a, it's one of my favorite topics, but... Um, so I think, you know, origins of consciousness, we, we can put a box around and we could get back to it if you want to, uh, origins okay. of the universe, <laughs> why the universe behaves according to the rules that apparently, you know, behaves according to, I think we, we, I try to make a rule that I don't try to pretend to be able to talk scientifically about, um, the likelihood of the universe being the way that it is. I think that when people try to play that game, it's fun sometimes for theoretical physicists to pretend it's possible to theorize about that. But it, it's sort of, uh, you can stack the deck however you like. You can write down some equations and say, here's my model of a universe creating machine. And uh, these are the consequences of these assumptions that I've made. Uh, and, and, and you never can kind of ask the empirical question, well, how do universes seem to be made, in fact? Because we only have one that we're experiencing um, almost by definition. And so I, I, I don't really traffic in, in arguments about, well, what were the odds that the rate of decay of this isotope would be what it is? Um, and, and therefore that made life possible. Like, you know, people talk about the triple alpha reaction in the sun and how, you know, you, you or, or in stars and, and how you can create, um, carbon only because certain quantities involving nuclear physics are exactly tuned so that you can make these like heavier elements. And the idea that that should be more or less likely, I, what I want someone to tell me is how they're computing probabilities of laws of physics being this way and not that way. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure that's you for the one topic we're trying to pull on. I, I, uh, I actually want to get onto more of the theological stuff, but I do want to follow up with this one point because you did mention Roger Penrose before. Mm -hmm. Um, and he's, he seems to be one of these people who did this, you know, by, by attempting to put a probability on the initial, uh, entropy conditions of the universe, which was like astronomical, I think 10 to the power of 123. Um, did you disagree with his approach there? Like, do you think that, that he, he shouldn't have been dabbling in probabilities? I, I think it's safe to say, and you know, Roger Penrose is obviously a, a brilliant man. Um, uh, and, uh, whenever people are saying these things, in one sense, they're saying, whenever people like him are saying things like this, they're saying them with a great deal of rigor given certain assumptions. But right. I think always it's also true when theoretical physicists talk this way, that if you pull enough, you can trace the thread back to certain assumptions that they're making just because they're the broadly accepted ones within their community of type of scientists that they are uh, that allows them to uh, start to reason from some assumptions. And uh, they're not necessarily, uh, you know, told to us with certainty, but more like they, uh, they, they seem reasonable or even worse in a sense, they seem beautiful. <laughs> they seem beautifully simple and, and maybe sufficient to explain many phenomena. And so then we don't want to ask, you know, whether in fact we know them to be true. We just assume them to be true. And so I don't know the details of, of the calculation to which you're referring. Um, so I shouldn't say more, you know, in detail on that subject, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to, you know, illustrate the point by talking more generally about the question of randomness as physicists talk about, because you mentioned wave particle duality also. It, it's, it's a very commonly uh, stated thing that we learn from quantum theory, right? That there are fundamentally random processes at the base of, of how the whole universe works. Um, and, and what that poses for us is the idea that, okay, well, um, yes, it's true that some things that seem random to us are really because it's kind of like the, the, the quarter we tossed in the air and it's skittering and bouncing and we don't know things about how it initially got flipped. And if we did, maybe we could actually predict how it falls. Um, but since we don't know them, our lack of knowledge puts us in a, in a state of uncertainty. Um, uh, but then quantum randomness is of a, a more perfect variety, right? That you can create perfect quantum randomness by just taking a quantum particle and measuring a certain thing about it and you will get a perfect coin toss from the random number generator at the bottom of the universe. You know, this is how quantum theory gets talked about, not just to the general public, but also when it's taught 
um, to budding physicists at uh, elite institutions. And I think that um, th there's something a little bit overly simplified about this description where it's kind of, uh, it's a beautiful way of thinking about things that works within the framework of a kind of a, a playing field of a certain theoretical game that works well for making predictions, but which relies on certain assumptions. Randomness has to be thought of as being like straight lines and circles and such. The same way there's no perfectly straight line in the world, there's no perfect circle, and there's no perfect randomness. All of these are mathematical constructions made by people that actually help us to build models of the world that we find useful for predicting things about the world. And so mm -hmm. we don't get to determine with certainty that certain things in the world are perfectly random and others are not. Rather, what we are actually saying is the ideal notion of randomness is useful to me in constructing a mathematical model that helps me to make certain kinds of predictions. Um, and, and that's the best we can do. So I think once we start saying the universe isn't the sort of full-blown complexity that we observe, but instead it's replaced by the mathematical idealization that we create of it, that's, you know, I think the essence of idolatry as described by the Hebrew prophets, right? It's it's taking the world and sort of replacing it with Maseya de Adam, like taking the, the your own construction and, and setting it above all. Uh, and, and that way ultimately leads down a crooked path. Okay, well said. Um, so let's pivot now into um, the the Judaic aspect of, of your book and um, and you as a person. Um, you chose to start each one of your chapters with um, with a verse from the Hebrew Bible. W what was the motivation for that? Why did you choose to construct it that way? So the the beginning of this was I wanted to write a book for the general public about theoretical work in physics about emergence of lifelike behaviors that I had been doing in my lab at MIT and that I've since carried forward um, now uh, in my uh, academic capacity at Georgia Tech. So um, that was the, the core motivation for writing a book to put some ideas out there for broader discussion and consumption um, and kind of get to set it all down in one place. Uh, but I think that as I was gearing up to do that, it just seemed to me like it was important not to pretend that I didn't realize that this would become part of a broader discussion, right? That uh, when you talk about where life came from, it it's unavoidable that it pulls at or it strikes chords in us, or it, 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 it pulls at us in, in ways intellectually and emotionally that don't just have to do with a very dry scientific uh, approach to the material properties of, of, of living things. Uh, and, uh, you know, I am someone, so my, my personal story is one that's uh, a little uh, convoluted with respect to these questions. You know, I, I grew up in a household that um, instilled me with a sense of Jewish identity, but gave me not very much religious education. Uh, and then in adulthood as a graduate student, after having already grown up significantly as a physicist, I, I started visiting the land of Israel and learning Hebrew and fell in love with Am Yisrael and uh, Talmud Torah, so the Jewish people and, and studying Torah. And, and it, it became uh, the way I wanted to found the way I live my life. But I didn't want to throw away being a scientist. And it didn't seem to me like the Torah was really asking that of me. But it took a lot of kind of thinking about how to make these things work together. In any case, I, I, I'm sorry for that long aside. No, but, no, that, that was necessary. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I only mean to say that um, given that that was where I was coming from, I, I, I do have a thing that I want to say about this topic, or let's say a, a perspective I want to bring to this topic that isn't just about the physics. Uh, and given that I, I felt like I couldn't write a book that would be just about the physics that wouldn't ultimately be picked up by someone else and made part of that discussion, possibly, you know, as a tool in, in someone else's argument that I might disagree with, I thought I shouldn't be kind of hiding uh, or, or insulating this discussion um, from that broader one. And so then I wanted to do it in a way where, on the one hand, I get to be thorough and intellectually honest about the physics but also put it in a wrapping that makes it impossible for someone to say I wrote a book that didn't bring in my own conviction that the Torah has a commentary to make on this science 
uh, that's really important for us to think about in parallel. Did you get any flack from anybody for having done it that way? Did you? Is there anybody who said, uh, you know, Dr. England, like keep keep their, keep your theology separate from your science? In, you know, yeah, sure. Um, you know, and I think that that's um, you know that that's happened in various forms along the way. I mean, most recently with the book, clearly there are some people where it's an axiom for them that any discussion of biblical religion, on the one hand and science on the other, those two things can't happen at the same time or else it's toxic or explosive or something. And so you just get excoriated for trying to do that regardless of what you've said. Um, and on the one hand, I understand that it's possible to do that in a kind of uh, careless way and to say things that are maybe not really taking the right approach either to scientific thinking uh, or to uh, relating to the text of the Hebrew Bible and, and how we're meant to read them and, and what they uh, can mean. So I, it's, I, it's not that I don't think one can fail or, or one can produce problematic syntheses of these ways of thinking, um, but I, I do think that one of the important points that I try in general to argue for, not just in the confines of the book, uh, is that the Torah knows what it is to reason scientifically about the natural world. Uh, and is very interested in what that way of reasoning can help us to understand about the world. But at the same time, it also understands limitations and even temptations, dangerous temptations, uh, in, in letting that be the sole and exclusive way that you describe what's true or predictable about the world. Uh, and, and so, yeah, I, I think I've, I, there's a, a certain fraction of the populace who are just immediately going to dismiss or even denounce <laughs> Uh, a book that tries to do these two things at the same time. But there's also been, I've gotten a tremendously positive reaction from other quarters, I think both from people who uh, are themselves rigorous scientists and feel that there's maybe a overly doctrinaire unwillingness to ask whether there's a way of talking about these two things at the same time within the scientific community. And so they appreciate an attempt to kind of show by example how that might be possible. Uh, and then also there are people who I think are coming in with a great deal of interest in the Hebrew Bible. Um, and they, I think maybe are excited to find that uh, th there may be a way forward to saying, oh, it, it is something you can do in parallel to talking about the science in a way where these two things are at loggerheads and, and where maybe they kind of are complementary, or you can both understand mm -hmm. the science a little bit better with the metaphorical language you get from the biblical text. And also the biblical text is giving you a commentary to help you grapple with the implications of relating to yourself as a quintessence of dust. So what, what example could you bring? Uh, you, you say that the Bible is interested in the scientific aspect of reality. Well, how would you demonstrate that? Because I think that a lot of people would find that surprising. Yeah, so I think you can pull this out of many passages. And I think part of the reason for that is this principle we have of shivim panim la Torah, that there, there's 70 faces to the Torah, meaning that it's not when you come to a passage in the Torah that you have to decide on one meaning that it has, and we finally figured out what it really is, and we can leave over. It, it's more that it, it it is true because of how many things it means. Uh, and so I wouldn't want to suggest that this is the only way of reading the passage I'll refer to, but I do think that if you look, for example, at the life and times of Yosef at Tzadik, you know, Joseph, the son of Jacob, there is a whole way of understanding his story that is all about the both advantages and attractions of scientific reasoning about nature and the positive applications of that. And at the same time, also the dangers and the temptations, because I think we're so used to uh, the premise in the text of Hebrew scripture that there are prophets who can tell, tell, tell the future because uh, the creator of the world has told them what it is, that we kind of don't notice that Yosef or Joseph is not necessarily a Navi, a prophet. Um, the book of, of, of Dvarim, of, of Deuteronomy, actually makes distinction between a Navi and a Cholem Chalom, like a, a prophet on the one hand and a dreamer of a dream on the other. And Yosef is definitely a Cholem Chalom, a dreamer of a dream. Um, but there, is, there are no verses that say, and God spoke to Joseph in the way that right. it refers right. to his forebears. So what is he doing when he predicts a famine after a bumper crop uh, in Egypt? And, and what 
what is the, the mechanism by which he does that? I think you can suggest, if you read the text closely, that it might be just that this is something that's predictable about the natural world, but not in a way that's obvious, which means that he's kind of more like, on the one hand, let's say, a climatologist, on the other hand, maybe a hedge fund manager, right, because he's buying low and selling high, and also a politician. And if you can be all three of those things at once, and you get the ear of the king who's running everything, then on the one hand, you may be in the position to save life in a way we, where we think of him as the hero of the story. And that's really a very positive thing, seemingly. But then when the other foot drops, he's really the architect of the mass enslavement of humankind and you know everyone in Egypt, right? That ultimately what Yosef does is he makes Paro so powerful uh, that Paro becomes this god king uh, who claims uh, supremacy over nature and makes everyone worship him. Uh, and, and so I think what that points to, you know, Yosef is on the one hand, the hero of the story who's successful at saving humanity with his, so to speak, technological or at least technical solution to a problem presented by nature and its hidden predictability combined with its unpredictability. Uh, but he also is someone who spends his entire life as a prisoner or as a slave or imprisoning people or enslaving people. And the whole feeling that you get overall is that if your, your view of what the world is, is too narrowly constrained into the idea of their natural laws and everything has to obey them. And if you know them, then you can predict everything. You haven't arrived at the correct conclusion because you're making a God out of power. Oh, out of the, the God King who claims supremacy over nature but is really a human being, uh, instead of making, you know, instead of raising a Katosh Baruch Hu, um, uh, to the height that he deserves and, and expects. And the antidote to this is Moshe, right? That, that Moshe is the opposite of Yosef in many ways. He comes in as, instead of the guy who does things, you know, with the predictability of the world and feeds everyone uh, by sort of natural mechanisms, Moshe is the guy who's making miracles constantly and takes a whole nation of people with three days of food and water into a desert and somehow feeds them miraculously, you know? So it, it's it's all about, you know, the message that Hashem is trying to bring is the antidote to that worship of science that ultimately leads in a sense to Egyptian slavery. That's deep, <laughs> that's important. Um, and something I've never considered in that particular story. So- um, I'll point to, by you. the way, there's an article in commentary um, and another one I wrote in Sinai and Synapses that are about different readings of Yosef as a scientist in ancient Egypt that people might be interested in. I would love to see that. Actually, if you could send it to me, I'd be really, I'd appreciate it. Uh, I have, a, basically, I have two more questions and then we unfortunately have to wrap up. Although I, this is the kind of conversation I could have for many hours personally. And I um, really want to thank you in advance for, for having taken the time to be with us tonight and also to encourage uh, all the people watching that please subscribe to h.com's um, YouTube channel, which you can do just below. Um, and then uh, you can get updated on all the materials and all the uh, great things that we have going on. This is a weekly program. We hope to see you here in the future. Um, that sounds like a wrap up, but I do have two more questions, which is you do talk about in the book, you talk about the breath of life <clears throat> and how that breath is blown into Humanity. So you have a you have a dead lump of earth that becomes animate as a result of God, the way it's expressed, blowing something into uh, into humanity who then becomes alive. Do you conceive of that breath as something immaterial, as something transcendent, metaphysical? Or is it somehow part of the physical world, and you you understand that to be a description of of your thesis of you know of how um, inanimate matter could become animate? So I, I think it's a great question, and um, certainly a very pertinent one to the last chapter of the book, um, as you mentioned. I think that. The way I, I maybe try to wriggle out of <laughs> the difficulty of, of this question um, uh, is by uh, trying to divide it into two ways of answering um, that adopt different stances. The first is one where we maintain our way of reasoning about the world scientifically um, that's, that's based in, you know, how does a physicist view the world and how do we... Um, uh, how do we understand uh, 
the world as a, a material construction. And the reason I think it's important is because I think the Torah is very interested when it talks about things that we usually think of as immaterial, all these words for soul, you know, like uh, neshama or uh, nefesh, you know, various other words in the Torah that maybe sometimes are translated as soul. Um, when you take words like those and look at what they mean in a literal sense, in the context of Torah, it's always the case that they have a very actually material counterpart, like nefesh, uh, we're told over and over and over again has this correspondence to blood, like that that the 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 blood is the nefesh or the nefesh is in the blood, and yeah. so the idea of nefesh as a soul is is still linked to the notion of a material substance, albeit a liquid one, that suffuses and connects the whole living thing. So on the one hand, it's very holistic, and it is more kind of uh, tempestuous, let's say, than a bone. You know, blood is uh, definitely Kind of softer and 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 subtler and and, and more unpredictable in some sense, um, but it, it is still we have a material thing that we call blood, um, and that's still here in the world, uh, made of material stuff. And also with breath, breath is air, right? Um, and and you can go on with all these other words um, if, if you want to, uh, one after the other that someone might have at some point used for something that seemed very spiritual, and and in some contexts within. Yeah, do it in Judaism. They sound like they're being used that way, but they have a correspondent always, a material one. The reason I think that's an important point is because I don't think that the Torah that the Torah wants us to make separation between these things uh, because there's a danger of dualism there, right? That that you don't want to relate to the world as, in a sense, they're kind of two systems of, of divinity that regulate and control two totally separate worlds that don't apparently in a predictable or law-like way interact um, because it so quickly turns into almost like you're talking about there are two gods um, right. instead right. of one. And so I think because of the unity of Hashem, there's this very lovely um, uh, midrashic discussion of this um, that appears uh, in the commentary on the Mishnah, which is talking about how anyone who says that the resurrection of the dead doesn't appear in the Torah as a heretic. And then there's this sort of debate and discussion between Yudan Nasi and Antoninus, um, which I think some people think of as, as Marcus Aurelius, the emperor. Um, and, and one point is that um, Hashem doesn't judge our souls and our bodies separately, right? That um, he... The horse and rider. Judged, he take, what's that? Sorry. The horse and rider concept. Yeah, or I think this one he's talking about a garden. like that. A, he like, It's likened to a king who asks a blind man and a man without legs to guard his garden. Um, and then they combine and one rides on the other shoulders and they steal all the fruit. And then they each say, oh, well, I couldn't right, have done right. it. Um, right. And so like the soul in the body, Hashem takes one, puts them on the other shoulders and judges them together, right? So like the king who judges the one thief who was made up of two different parts. Um, and and I, think, I think you see this elsewhere in the tradition as well. There's a, a resistance to the idea of fully separating these things. And... and so the way I put it is that on the one hand, the notion of the breath of life in the Torah, you should try as hard as you can to understand the material aspect of that point, which is that things like breath and wind and blood and, you know, fluids are much more complexly unpredictable than other simpler material aspects of the world, but they are still material and there can be a lot of subtlety hidden in what you don't fully know about what's going on in them, right? That when you see snow on the wind, you suddenly see all these whirls going around in different directions. And if the snow weren't there, you'd have no idea what was moving where. It's, it's mostly unobservable. Uh, so I think that there's this aspect of uh, Ruach Hashem, like the, the, the wind of God. It's another example of an actually material thing that's referred to, we think of, and sometimes Ruach is, is often translated as spirit. Um, that when Ruach Hashem is present, um, I think that there's something very healthy about trying as a physicist to say, well, there's a whole lot about what's going on in what I'm experiencing that's getting poked in a million different ways by factors that I don't see, and I don't really, I can't add them all up, that the world is partly unpredictable because of my lack of knowledge of all the actions going on within it, um, and th the multitude of variables I'm not monitoring or measuring. And just that alone, puts you existentially in a state of uncertainty about what's going to happen, um, which 
uh, I think ultimately helps us to feel ourselves to be in the hands of the world's creator, right? That what will happen isn't certainly predictable for us. It's only certainly known uh, to HaKadosh Baruch Hu because he's the one who arranges it all. So I think there's that aspect of it that um, is, is worth trying to, to argue for. But I think at the same time, I know that that's not totally satisfactory because part of the reason people are attracted to the idea of neshama, like a soul, uh, is because of what I mentioned before, this kind of feeling that uh, nothing in a material study of the brain or the body or anything like that could do justice to what we feel as subjective beings experiencing our, our own consciousness and our own life. Um, and I think that's true, but I, I think that that becomes an extra scientific discussion. You really have to roll that all the way back to, well, why do we think there's anything but our own experience? Because there isn't really uh, scientific evidence for that per se. It's more that we personally find it a useful way of navigating our experience to start to become, or really we, we do this before we're you know even fully thinking children, but we get socialized into acting according to many assumptions that kind of model the world for us as though it's composed, among other things, of people who, like us, have subjective, subject, subjective experience that resembles our own. Um, and, and it's a pretty kind of a crazy, mind-bending way of talking. But I think the reason it's important uh, is because, I, to me, it, it very much connects with this pasuk uh, in, in Psalm 27 um, uh, from David HaMelech, from, from King David, where he says, um, uh, that uh, my, my father and my mother ha have, have left me and Hashem has taken me up. And I, I think part of what that points to is that we first learn to relate to our parents as the conscious beings who, you know, have kind of a, a, a who are subjects in their own right uh, that we can communicate with. Um, but ultimately there is a, a greater and more difficult task of achieving that same kind of relationship to the created world as a whole uh, and, and having that encounter with the Baruch Hu. And I think the Torah is meant to be a guide to us in that. Uh, but uh, it's one that I think that we have to pursue, recognizing that to some degree, maybe uh, it, it requires uh, thinking of our own ex subjective experience in terms of how Olam Nivra Bishfili, as the Talmudic sages put it, you know, that, that the world is created for me. And now it's kind of a, a dialogue that I'm a party to. Well, Dr. England, thank you so much for your deep uh, insights and your fantastic book, which once again, I will just give a plug. Please go out and read Every Life is on Fire. It's a fantastic read, very accessible um, and a beautiful work. And um, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I really appreciate it. And um, please join us next week. Uh, we have Stephanie Arnold, who uh, is somebody who uh, went through a near-death experience. He wrote a book called 37 Seconds. We're going to be talking about that. And in the meantime, have a wonderful week. Shabbat shalom, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Shabbat shalom. Take care.